The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Good evening, everybody. This is Alan Blumkin. I'm here with my friend David Nemec. And another uh, uh, edition of uh, David Nemec's Baseball History and Statistics. Welcome, David. Uh, welcome to you, Al. Once again, a pleasure always to be with you. Same here. Okay, uh, we, we're going to discuss uh, the award process. I'm sure we have uh, very, very <laughs> unfavorable opinions of the way things are going now, but we'll see. Okay, David. Well, it's it's, it's interesting because that. Uh, all, except for the, the Cy Young, it uh, was established in uh, 1956, uh, and was only li- was limited to to one pitcher per year, uh, including both leagues. Uh, other than that, the Cy Young Award has been pretty stable uh, throughout its history, whereas MVP awards and Rookie of the Year awards have been all over the place. Uh, as far as the rules, eligibility, and so forth, uh, so we might we might actually start with, uh, if you like, we can start with rookies, uh, which a, a rookie of the year really first started. What I believe it was 1946 with Kiner, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Al? I was 47 with uh, 47 Rocky with Robinson. Robinson. Okay, and then it was uh, one, you know, one. It wasn't one pro league until I think 1949. Yeah, 49, and as a result, 1948, Alvin Dark uh, got it playing short yeah, right. shortstop for for the Braves, and Gene Bearden, who won 20 games in the American League, uh, and really was you know, pretty much the pitcher who brought Cleveland the national championship that year. Uh, and was a rookie, a uh, genuine rookie, uh, was shut out completely. And well, 49, it went to both leagues. And National, uh, National League in 1948, Richie Ashburn also had a sensational rookie year with the Phillies. He did. He did. I think, I don't know how the votes were split, but I would think they were pretty close. Yeah, in 49, uh, it was Seavers, Roy Seavers with the Browns of all the teams, and Don Newcomb. Yeah, that's, yes, that's right. Yes, yeah, Newcomb. And, uh, but the uh, 1950 uh, presented an interesting problem. Um, they really, there really were no rules then as to what, 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 uh, what was the uh, what a rookie? What constituted a rookie? Uh, was it a player who never played a major league game before? Was it a player who played only a certain number? Uh, nobody really. There were no hard and fast rules. Uh, as far as as you know, back in the early back in 1940, I believe uh, Pete Reeser uh, was considered for or uh, 41. He was considered for Rookie of the Year award, even though he played half a season in 1940, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, there were nobody, nobody really knew. Dick Wakefield, was, when was he a rookie? Uh, if you play a few games, were you considered a rookie? Uh, Kiner, you know, Kiner had – Jackie Robinson made it easy because Jackie Robinson hadn't played any major league ball before 1947. Uh, but in 1950, there became a, a, a serious problem. The award went to Walt Dropo, who was certainly deserving for his stats, the Boston Red Sox, but even more deserving in the estimation of many people was Al Rosen of the Cleveland Indians, who had the American League at home runs in his his first full season. But Rosen, because he played a few games in 47, again in 48, and in 49, uh, was not considered a rookie. Uh, by today's standards, uh, Rosen would be considered, would have been considered a rookie, and would have pro- would have gotten the award probably fairly comfortably over Dropo. And this kind of thing went on until finally, 
uh, rules were established, but those rules have changed, I think, a bit, even uh, in the last few years, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the Um, National League in 1950 was Sam Jethro, who had come from the Negro Leagues and was six years older than uh, the backs of his baseball cards uh, listed. Right. And um, and Jethro, of course, if you accept uh, the new definition of what constituted major leagues, uh, which include the Negro Leagues, uh, would hardly have been a rookie in 1950. Uh, so, you know, a lot of this is, you know, historical, uh, of historical importance because uh, certainly, um, you know, there were changes. There were a lot of changes over the seasons. And what, what about the what about the American League rookie? How many how many games did he play uh, in uh, 2020? Quite a few, didn't he? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, as a Raider, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he. Uh, well, there weren't that many started. games in the 2020. <laughs> yeah, well, there were 60 game season. He, yeah. I know. And of, of the sixty games, he got into. I don't. I don't have the stats in front of me, but he got into a fair percentage of them. Uh, if you if you uh, conflated that to a hundred and sixty two game season, uh, he played. I don't know how many games did he play, but he probably played close to twenty, didn't he? Yeah, I don't know, but it's possible that they threw out last year's twenty twenty as an aberration. They could have, they yeah. could have, and then counted him as a rookie this year. I'm not really sure because yeah. um, I worked with Dave Zeman on a book about baseball rookies, the baseball rookies. Yeah, I have that somewhere here. Yeah, and, and he, uh, we're going to come out with a new edition probably in a couple more years, and uh, we're going to have to do some scrambling around because things have changed since we wrote our original uh, edition in 2003. Uh, which included the 2003 season, and um, it's we're gonna, you know, I know that uh, we, we're going to have some explaining to do why, you know, why uh, the changes were made if if and uh, it, whether and what re, what major league what major league baseball still constitutes what constitutes a rookie in major league baseball I think is very different than what what constitutes a rookie in the estimation of uh, baseballreference.com. I don't think they're consistent. Uh, I haven't researched it carefully enough to know that for sure, but there seem to be a, a number of number of changes just in the 18 uh, year period since we came out with the original edition. One uh, thing I re- uh, yeah. One thing I remember is that uh, Willie McCovey was named NL Rookie of the Year in 1959. He played about 60 games. Yeah. Exactly. There were no there were no restrictions on how few you could have had to play. You know how many you had yeah. to play, but there were restrictions on, on you know there were if, if there were if you played too many, you weren't a rookie. Uh, but there were really the, the restrictions were there were, you could play any amount. I mean you you could theoretically if you were like Bob Hazel, who had played a number of games before the. Uh, is is the fifty fifty seventh season when he had this, you know, dominance, you know, four over four hundred appearance late in the season when he came in uh, with the Braves. Uh, Bob Hazel, Bob Hazel could have been considered a rookie that year and possibly won the Rookie of the Year award. There's no restrictions on the number of bats you had to have or the number of innings you had to pitch. Uh, it was all kind of left up to uh, up to the writers at the time. I think the 1957 Rookie of the Year in the National League went to Jack Sanford, the pitcher. If yeah, I remember correctly. Yeah, it did. It did. No, Hazel. I don't even know if Hazel was considered a rookie that year. Uh, he may not have been. I'd have to go back and look at what we, Dave, and I decided. But um, I, you know, it's. But it's uh, it's an, it's interesting because you know Newcomb certainly. Uh, and Roy and Roy Seaver, the two rookies who in, in 1949 both went on to uh, produce substantial major league careers. Uh, Newcomb won the Cy Young, of course, in, 19, in the first Cy Young in 1956, and Seavers had many, many good seasons. 
throughout his career, lasting into the 1960s, uh, was one of the game's more prominent sluggers. He wasn't really a slugger when he came up at all. Uh, he was more of a, you know, hit to all fields kind of guy. He had a very good season for the Lowly Browns, but um, wow, he, he had injury problems uh, the rest of his time with the Browns. Yeah, yeah, he did. And it wasn't until he came back in the 50s with Washington and then later with, the, I believe, the White Sox. And then, even you know, he even did some time in the National League. There's a I'm story, uh, the, yeah, right before the uh, 54 season, uh, uh, the St. Louis Browns, yeah, now the Baltimore Orioles, traded him to Washington, even up for Gil Cole. And when Severs turned out to be a star and Cone you know, was out of the league in a couple of years, they found out that uh, when the Oriole general manager had an old medical report on Severs, they didn't know he was healthy. So he made the oh, trade. Boy. And it was a, one of the few good trades that uh, the Washington uh, team made in the 1950s. Yeah, well, they, they got, they got and yeah, it was. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. No, that's, uh, but yeah, but there were yeah, there were a lot there were a lot of rookies. If you go back, uh, there were controversial rookie selections in uh, nineteen nineteen sixty. I believe it was sixty one. Uh, Don Schwan of the Boston Red Sox was awarded Rookie of the Year, even though Dick Hauser, uh, who came up with the lowly Kansas City Athletics that season, had him. Tremendous year with the Athletics as, as their shortstop, played in a lot of games, stole bases, was an excellent fielder, uh, dominated the voting and for the Sporting News Rookie of the Year. But uh, major, as far as the Major League is concerned, the Rookie of the Year was Don Schwal. And uh, there have been a lot of controversial uh, decisions ever since as to the Rookie of the Year. I don't know. Uh, about the rookies, two rookies this year. What do you think? Are they going to be guys you're going to be hearing from for quite a while? Well, I, I think uh, Rosa Reina will be. The guy in the National League, in fact, I had to look his first name up because I didn't know it. A guy in Cincinnati named Jonathan India, like the country. And I, had, I, don't, I don't know anything about him. I never saw him. Yeah. No, I didn't either. I, I said, I look up his here. name. I, I, I never heard of him before. He was rookie, named rookie of the year. No, no, I didn't realize that. I didn't, yeah, you know. and uh, yeah, it's and there are a lot. There are there are a lot of rookies like that over the year that you, you hear about. Super Joe Charbonneau, oh yeah, the Indians was rookie of the year, uh, and really. Um, in the second year, he got injured. He got into trouble. He got fined. He kind of kind of jaked it at times, and was pretty much out of base. Pretty much out of baseball by three or four years later, and never never amounted to anything after his rookie season. Uh, and there are, there are, there are a lot of stories like that uh, with, of guys, and uh, there are also you know stor- incredible stories about guys who were rookies before 1947. Uh, whose rookie seasons were buried because there weren't any awards given then to, to rookies. Uh, they, they came up in season maybe when the MVP award was there, so they were competing for that. That was the only award they could really p- compete for, and they never got their due uh, for their rookie showings. But well, in 1950, that goes all the way yeah. back in history to you in know, even to the 19th century. In 1951 in the American League, Gil McDougall, as much as I like the Yankees, I liked him, was named Rookie of the Year. Uh, the White Sox had a player named Minnie Minoso, who had a much better year than McDougall did. In every way, yeah. And, uh, was... you know, they, they wouldn't give it to him. I don't know the fact that he was black and, and uh, Hispanic that had to into it, or the fact that they were used to picking Yankees because they won it all the time. Well, he was he actually was, but he was the Yankees' first first official rookie of the year. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, yeah, Bob Grimm was the second one. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But uh, you're right. That that was one of the more you know that that to me was an injustice 
uh, in some ways even greater than the Hauser Schwal uh, Rookie of the Year award season uh, because Minoso was from the outset a great player. Of course, he wasn't really a rookie in the true sense of the word if you uh, consider a Negro League's part of the Major League fabric now. And they put some uh, games with he, the Indians in 1949, I think. He played some and he played a few games with the Indians, but they yeah. didn't count those games against no. him uh, at that point in '51. And I think there was some there was further the controversy in '50. Uh, they did start to accept. Well, okay, if you played a few games prior to uh, your the first third season where you really stuck stuck around to do something, we're not going to count it against you. But uh, prior to then, got, you know, guys like Rosen kind of got the short end of the stick, I think. But uh, we can we can move on if, if probably to uh, the Cy Young next and uh, talk about how what about even even this year's winners. I think you may know more about them than I do. At least I hope you do because it, you know. I I wasn't paying, I have to admit, a whole lot of attention to what was going on this season. And these two guys were uh, bare names to me. I knew nothing about them. And um, well, what do you Zach, think? Zach Wheeler and the Philly should have won it. Should he? Yeah, yeah. yeah over Burns, because uh, Burns is another one I know, I, know, I know nothing about. I'm a walkie. And uh, but uh, Wheeler led the National League in innings pitched. I think he led them in strikeouts, and but he pitched the Phillies, who so did not make the playoffs. But that's you know the pitcher has an outstanding year, even, even if his team is lousy. Uh, that should uh, that should count even more. It and should. in the yeah. American League, they gave it to. Uh, uh, Robbie Ray. Robbie Ray of Toronto, and the second was Garrett Cole. Now Garrett Cole had a great first half of the season, but he was pretty bad. He had an ERA of over four in the second part of the season, and the Yankees started him in a wild card game, and he didn't even make it out of the first inning. Yeah, something something happened to him in the second half. Yeah, supposedly the when they started checking for. Uh, Foreign substances. Uh, yeah, although he he claimed it wasn't that he claimed it was he had I don't re, I don't remember it was wrist trouble or elbow trouble or something wasn't quite right with him in the second half. But um, I'll tell you the right. worst uh, yeah. the worst pitcher ever to win a Cy Young Award was none other than Mark Davis, the Kansas City. <laughs> Yeah, well, and then he, he was a free agent. He went out to San Diego for big money at the time, and uh, he was terrible. Yeah, well, you had, you had some really in, you've had some really interesting winners over the years. Like Pete, was it Pete Broberg won him in year, and uh, Lamar Hoy, guy, guys whose names are just you know, you know. F- fragmentary memories, if that. Yeah, John for, Denny and the uh, Phillies. Modern yeah. fans. Yeah, Denny, and it, it used to be that, you know, in the beginning it was, you know, wins counted for a lot. If you, you you almost had to be a 20-game winner to be in the running for, for the Cy Young Award. But uh, that, that had us fallen away completely. Uh, and relief pitchers, of course, are eligible too, so that part has fallen away. Um, you don't have to have a certain number of innings pitched. There are no minimum, minimums or maximums of anything. Uh, it's just the, the pitcher who has done the best for his team. And I, I agree with Al that uh, a, a guy, you know, a guy did, you know, Wheeler did a great job with a not very good team and uh, did not get the award. And, and, and yet on that same team, a guy who did a great job, uh, got the MVP award, and uh, there were other guys who certainly I think were likely contenders as well. Because uh, well, we'll get to that in a few minutes when we when we talk about the MVP. Yeah, I think uh, Saber at one point did uh, retro Cy uh, Young winners. Uh, you know, be- uh, both ways uh, from 1956 to 1966. And 
you know, and retro, you know, like in the you know, for seasons that there weren't any Cy Young awards. Given given to one one league or the other, didn't get the get an award. Like in, in 1952, yeah. it would have been uh, Bobby Shantz in the American League and Robin Robertson in the National League. Yeah, without without yeah, any that, question. that type of thing. Yeah. 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 No, and of course it. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's interesting that the Cy, it took so long for the Cy Young Award to develop. Um, that um, because pitchers pitchers from the outset uh, were always eligible for MVP awards, and several and several and several got it. I believe Carl Hubble got it in 1933, and. Jim Constanti, uh, relief pitcher, mainly a relief pitcher with the Phillies, got it. Well, nineteen sixty-eight, nineteen sixty-eight, you had it in both leagues. McLean yeah, in the American, American League and Bob Gibson in the National League. Right, right, yeah, and that, uh, yeah. So pitchers were eligible for the MVP, but still, um, they weren't. You know, by by nineteen fifty-six, it was becoming clear. I think uh, I'm hoping it was anyway that uh, the, the game was changing. Uh, you weren't you weren't expected to go nine, necessarily to go nine innings every time you 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 went out there, and uh, relief pitchers were becoming important. People like Ellis Kinder and uh, guys like Herschel Freeman who had a good year or two. Now and, Elroy Face. <laughs> uh, Elroy Face, of course, who really made a career mostly as a relief pitcher. Uh, these were these 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 guys weren't on the scene much in the 40s. There were really there were people who were pretty much relief pitchers like Gordon Malsberger and uh, Earl Caldwell with the White Sox. Joe Page with the Pace Virginia. Adams. Yeah, that, that type, yep. yeah. yeah, that type of guy. There were Hugh there Casey. were a few. Yeah, and Hugh Casey. But they also start. They also made stars. Casey was also a starter. And. Uh, well, yeah, Stengel used uh, after Stengel, Allie Reynolds had a year in 1952. He was 20 and 8 and had a 270 or 208 ERA. He led the league in, in the ERA. And then for those remaining two years, he was basically a relief pitcher. Yeah. Yeah, Allie. And, and to me, uh, Allie, Allie Reynolds never, re, never, got a, never got a major award at any point in his career. And never, never, to my mind, has never gotten the recognition he deserves for, in all respects, because you know, I'm I'm met once with his granddaughter and and her husband, and she wanted to wanted to see how we could get her, you know, her grandfather in the Hall of Fame, and I said it's going to be really tough because a lot of years have passed, and um, he didn't win 200 games. And, 182 uh, and Yeah, yeah, he had a very good winning percentage. But of course, he pitched for the Yankees. Everybody had a good winning. My percentage. pitch for Cleveland is record, is, is record yeah. with the Yankees because uh, I've studied Rashi Reynolds and Walt Patton until my eyes uh, got tired. Uh, he was 131 and 60 with the Yankees, which is like a 685 percentage. Yeah, yeah. So, but he, but he brought. And he brought, you know, mediocre, you know, not not a great forty-seven season from the Indian. Uh, he had he had a couple good year, pretty good years during the war. He came up pretty late. Uh, he was in his, I think, his late his latter twenties, or maybe at twenty-six, even twenty-seven when he came well, up. Well, I will tell you something about him. Uh, I went up to Hall of Fame uh, one year, and I was looking at all three of the pitchers' folders. And uh, I saw three different birth years for Reynolds. I saw 14, 15, <laughs> and 18. I, 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 I didn't know which was which. You know, uh, this accepted date is 15 now. Except the yeah. year is 15. But uh, he filled out a questionnaire, and he put down 18. Who knows? Yeah. A lot of players back in those uh, back in those days between the Negro Leagues and the war would cut a year or two off their uh, yeah their birth year, so you know they could get they could get playing time. Yeah. No, I well Reynolds, yeah, he um, 
Yeah, he he, he was uh, to me to my mind he was one of the 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 uh, st- actual actual star really this one of the star pitchers of his era. Uh, once he went to New York, uh, he really came into his own. And I don't you know I I think of Stengel were alive today and consulted and uh, asked who was, who was the most valuable pitcher you had while while you were managing the Yankees. He wouldn't he wouldn't name Whitey Ford. I don't think. I think he would go with. I'm almost sure he would go with Ali Reynolds as as his top you know pitcher. He was the go to guy in in the really big games and at the really big moments uh, when when at all possible to use him. And he got. He got injured in a, in a, in a train accident. Kind yeah, of, a bus accident. accident. Yeah, a bus accident. Yeah, yeah, and he never was the same after that. He probably was good for another year or two. But, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. He he played. Uh, that happened in '53. Uh, he was uh, played fifty, fifty-four, and then retired. He said they couldn't train anymore. If he couldn't yeah. train, he couldn't play. Uh, Rashi was yeah. 120 and 50 with the Yankees. And Rashi didn't go up to the major leagues until he was 28. Yeah. So, you know, his, his uh, uh, years were uh, limited. And well, Pat was, uh, by the time he got to the Yankees, he was 30. Yeah. He pitched with the White Sox for several years. And, uh, you know, uh, and he was very effective uh, through 60, 54 with the Yankees. Yeah, he was. He was, and, yeah. And Tommy Byrne, even though he had, didn't exactly have the greatest control, <laughs> was probably the hardest pitcher in his time to hit. I mean, he had uh, opponents' batting averages were ridiculously low uh, against him in uh, in forty eight and forty nine. But he gave up so many walks it was masked. People didn't realize how effective, how hard, how hard this guy was really. To even make contact against, and how you know how much stuff he had. Well, and I know Stengel used to you know turn his head away, but, you know, in, in the middle of a game when the bases were loaded and Burn had to had to come in with it and started throwing strikes. And uh, but but I you know I remember seeing him pitch, but I saw him pitch when he was older. I didn't see him in forty eight nine. Yeah. Uh, and then when he was older, I know I think he t- he toned. Either he toned down a bit in, his, in how hard he threw, or yeah, he did that he in didn't Seattle. Have it, didn't have, yeah, he and did I, that. You know, and then, there in 19, and the Yankees got rid of him in 1951. I read this somewhere because uh, Weiss and the, the topping and Webb couldn't stand watching him. Yes, yeah. so he bounced around from the Browns to the White Sox to the Senators. Then he wound yeah. up in Seattle in 1954. Uh, with uh, under Fred Hutchinson, and uh, he, he won some control, and he came back and had a big year in the in the 1955, and he retired after 1957. He was also ter- a terrific hitter for a pitcher. Yeah, he was. Mm-hmm. He was. He's one of one of the forgotten names, really, from that era, and. Uh, I don't think anybody's ever done a biography uh, of him, a full, certainly not a full-length biography. No, no, and, and, no. I, and I think it would be a fascinating read, just you know, a study of the way pitching or pitchers developed in those years and how they had to run into somebody, and he ran into Hutchinson. And I think Hutchinson probably helped him a lot. Uh, Hutchinson yeah, because, was a good teacher and a good manager. Yeah, because... Uh... Maybe there's a, bio, a biography of him on the Saber Biography Project. I don't know. I don't know either. I, I haven't looked, but uh, that would be that would be an interesting one to read to see what. Uh, yeah, definitely. So, but so we move on to the MVP. The, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do you think about this year's selections? Harper, I, I have. I really don't have a problem with because the second the runner up to him was Juan Soto in Washington, who was on a, he was on a team that was even worse than the Phillies. Yeah. The American League, don't get me don't get yeah. me started. I was I expected uh, it, obviously, but I, it was unanimous. Yeah. And I I I I I I made this argument several times on Facebook. 
It was unanimous. It's, well, unanimous, unbelievable. And uh, unbelievable. I said, how how can uh, this guy hit two fifty nine? He struck out one hundred eighty nine times. Yeah, well, and he did I, nothing I, in the I, second half of the season. He played for a team that won seventy two games. I know, I know. How can he be a most? I, I made the same type of, well, argument, type of argument with Trout two years ago. Yeah, I know, I know, but but he also had that nine and three record, and he had, he was the only pitcher on the Angels to it's even over. clear a hundred innings. I know that. Uh, yeah. wor- the worst worst pitching staff in the majors, really. Worst they, the Pirates. They just they just yeah. haven't figured out that the game is played. You know, half the game is played on defense, and you need a pitcher because they they keep signing these the you know, offensive you know big offensive players to huge contracts, and yeah. uh, I, I don't know the if they saw it. Yeah, I, uh, I call the Angels as a place where free agents and free agents got to die. Yeah, well, they, when they they didn't learn with Pujols because they didn't. They got Anthony Rendon to play third base, and he hasn't had any anywhere near the same kind of seasons he had the last season, in particular with Washington. And uh, and there's Trout, who's you know. He hits in the low 300s, maybe in the 290s, and he's always in the MVP running when he plays a full season. And yet, how valuable is he really to this team? He's playing um, one one playoff series, a division series, which they, I think they lost in four games. That's the extent yeah. of his. So I, I tell, and I get, I, I, I get, I, when I put something like that down, I get firestorms. I set firestorms on Facebook. And uh, I, I said, you come and talk to me about travel. He plays in games that are meaningful. Yeah. I said, there are a lot no. of players. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that about him or Otani. Uh, but there are a lot of players out there who are very comfortable playing for teams that stink because there's no pressure. There's no pressure and there's big money. And, yeah, you're right. And uh, they and they, they can play they can play for stats. They can, you know. And uh, they they post good stats year after year, and there's really you know, you're right. You, they don't have to do the things that you have to do if you're playing on a winning team. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I thought Vladimir Guerrero, who almost dragged the uh, Blue Jays into the playoffs, yeah, he missed out the last day of the season, uh, was much more valuable to his team than Otani. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. But when I suggest this on Facebook, which is the only other player who did what he did was Babe Ruth. He says, oh, time yeah. to get 40 whatever home months. And I said, well, the last two years that Babe Ruth pitched the, you know, often in 1918 and 1919 with dead ball errors, nobody had home runs during that. Yeah. And he had 29 no, home no. runs in 1919. Then when he came yeah. to the Yankees, he made full time and He's made a full-time position player and at 54. Yeah. They're saying, well, you know, and Otani, uh, Otani really tailed off, off after the All-Star game. Maybe he uh, suffered what the number of players have suffered that, uh, you know, they entered the home run derby that they can't do anything after it. Well, it it was a full season. It was the first time he really played a full season. Yeah. Uh, with, where he actually pitched enough to, uh, you know, to to post post a record that was of, of some substance, and and also of course he you know he was he hit he hit with power, uh, and he was really a full time player and and pretty much uh, lived up to the expectations that uh, came with him when he was first signed for that huge 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 sum. And that the angels ended up forking over, and um, I don't know. You know, I, it's 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 it. I agree with you that uh, Guerrero. I think was when I when what I've read, what I've seen. I didn't really see that much of of him play, but uh, probably should have gotten the MVP. Well, there's a there's a whole slew of those. There's uh, 1952 when. Uh, the National League was Hank Sauer. Right. Because right. he led the league in home runs and RBIs. And Robert Roberts yeah. won 28 games for the Phillies. I know. Because yeah, they gave it to Bobby Chance in the American League. I should have given the Robert Roberts in the National League. Yeah, it, 
It was crazy. It was crazy. With the MVP, we, the history of the MVP really started uh, back with the Chalmers, Chalmers Award in, 19, in 1910, uh, where they gave a car to the t- uh, top player in each league. And if you were voted, and you, people wonder, why didn't Ty Cobb get more, you know, wasn't he, why wasn't he MVP more than he was? And the, the reason is because uh, once you were MVP in the ch- both the Chalmers contests and the league contests, which began in the 20s, you were ineligible for yeah. that, from there on for getting a, getting a second crack at it. Yeah, that so, was you know, unbelievable in the 20s especially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, had, you had guys who were getting, you know, votes for the MVP or uh, Huey Kreitz of the, of the uh, you know, I think he was with the Reds most of his career. Um, you know, he would get he would get MVP votes, and Rabbit Moranville would get MVP votes, and uh, but the, Moranville, in fact, the only guy who ever got uh, really got votes in the Chammers Award, the League Award, and then the you know when the Writers Award started in in, in 1931. Uh, Gosh, in, in 1925, did the American League go to Roger Peckinpah? Yeah. Oh God. Yeah, well, I mean, he's on, he's, on a, he's on a winning team and World Series entrant, and uh, they'd already well, he, given it to Ruth. They don't, you know, Cobb had, you know. Well, Ruth, Ruth, they couldn't uh, give it to because that was the year yeah. he was, you know. Yeah, he, the, even, if he, even if he did 80 homers that year. Yeah, but no, he played 90 games. That was the year of the bellyache. Yeah, no, and, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, keeping but, the candidate. Uh, but. And Peckinpah was terrible in the, world, in the field in the World Series, I guess. Yeah, he was. He was. But uh, it's it's crazy how they, you know, how they, uh, you know, the voting went. And then Chambers was abandoned finally. And uh, and then there weren't any league awards in the late teens. And then he came up with a, a league award in the 1920s. And that only went, I think, to, what, 28 or 29. And then uh, for a couple of years there, there were no, no MVP awards at all. Yeah, in 1930, yeah. the biggest hitting season in the in the majors, probably ever. Although 19, 1894 certainly gives it a run for the its money. Uh, there were no MVP awards that year, so we'll never know who uh, who the MVP awards, let alone Cy Young winner, would have been. And uh, let <clears throat> Lefty Grove would have <clears throat> been a candidate, certainly <clears throat> for the prime. <clears throat> side, excuse me. For the Cy Young, but the MVP would have been a tough choice. And he got it in 1931. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he did. Once, once it came into existence, and um, you know, he had he had those great seasons, 30 and 31, where he was really dominant. I thought in 1959 that. Uh, Henry Aaron should have gotten it over Henry or Ernie Banks. Yeah, Banks uh, got it two years in a row for being in that second division team. Um, not not that he didn't have great, great seasons, he did, but it, they didn't they didn't mean a whole lot. And, and it, maybe they got elevated the Cubs from sixth to fifth, but uh, they certainly were never in contention, really. Uh, for almost his entire career, this guy played with some pretty abysmal, pretty abysmal teams for almost all of his prime seasons. Yeah, and, two uh, other, yeah, two other ones that I, from that era, I disagree with. What Duke Snyder should have gotten the, over Roy Campanella in 1955, and that uh, Mickey Mantle should have gotten it over Roger Maris in 1961. Yeah, he should have because you know Mar- Maris is you know Mantle's all around play. Well, although he was hurt, he did miss some games from injuries. But his all around play in center field as a base runner and as a hitter uh, certainly marked him as the, I, I think the top player. You know, well, they never walked the Roger Maris intentionally that year because that year because Mantle was right behind him. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, so they had a pitch to Yeah, that's. But but uh, what's 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 happened? In fact, uh, 
my friend Jim Haller in Pittsburgh put out a post uh, the other day. It says, on the eighth day, God, in, God invented baseball. I said, in 2020, Satan killed it. Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got a number of likes on that comment. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. You're right. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, the game is not what it was, and I don't know whether we're going to, no. you know. It, no, it's, it, uh, everything is based on analytics. Yeah, it really is. I tell you, the, yeah. the, I think the worst player ever to win an MVP award was Zoya Versailles. I'm sorry, who? Zoya Versailles, the 1965 Twins. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, who are they going to give it to that year? I mean, Tony Oliva, Oliva. was. They could have given it to Oliva. That was that was his rookie season, right? No, the second 64. season. Second season, sixty-four. Okay, sixty-five. Yeah, um, yeah but it, the South played shortstop. Uh, had had some stolen bases. Um, played played with a surprise pennant winner. Um, yeah, but based upon what happened to him after that, uh, you certainly can mount a case that this was hardly a guy that was a real force for much in, you know, throughout yeah, his no, career. Yeah, I know. But overall, for a career, I mean, he was not very good. No, no, so he wasn't. I, anyway, I think what's happened in the last number of years. I think it's more and more is that the analytics are deciding. Yeah. Yeah, the science. Writers, really, writers look at that stuff first before they go to. Oh, yeah. They, they, they uh, gave two Cy Youngs in a row to Jacob DeGrom, whose one loss records weren't very good. Well, the Cy, they had, every time they pitched, the Mets would go. You know, it would be shot out of a square run. And uh, the MVP especially, you know, they said that Otani's war was, you know, I mean, they use war as a measuring stick now. Uh, you, that, they really shouldn't. Look, you, uh, yeah, you, you, you know, Sabre runs a uh, analytics conference every year. And I look at topics and I said, I wouldn't last two seconds at any of them. Yeah, you're right. And, but you're right. Uh, yeah, and it's to me, it's and uh, yeah, people of our age bracket that's really destroyed it. When I yeah, told, yeah. Uh, when I told the guys the other night how little I watched during the season, George K said to me, "He, he watched less." <laughs> yeah, I no, I believe it. I I watched very little I, in the postseason. I watched more. But I never saw it, I, an entire game during the entire, you know, the whole season. I never well, watched the game. You got it early. Yeah, yeah. You got it early. Yeah, we got it early. Yeah, we got it early. I can, I can clock, stay up. I can stay watch up. Watch four hours. Yeah, I, I, I watched watch, uh, watch this. Yeah, I watched that eighteen inning game. You know, uh, you the know, World Series uh, last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, and I was I was up for it because you know that three hour time difference. Uh, game start those you know it started at five o'clock out here. And, yeah. Uh, the same with college football. You know, college football starts at nine o'clock in the morning. I, you uh, know, the pros start at ten. Yeah, by out by you. The pros start at ten. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, and everything everything's changed as a result. I do I could watch more uh, than I do certainly, but baseball just. I don't know. It's it's really tough to watch a game now. It really is a slog and uh just really strikeouts and home runs and it's developed into something of an arcade game and that's unfortunate. Maybe 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 things will change around but Yeah, I'd rather know. watch a it, game in a dead ball era than watch this stuff that they had now. I, yeah, a re, yeah, I I yeah. Want, I prefer to watch replays from the eighties and seventies and if they go back to the sixties that's even more pressure. And no, I, if you go back I, into the fifties, I'd love it, but they don't. on YouTube there's a uh, video of the seventh game of the nineteen fifty two World Series, and uh, oh. I counted one. I watched it uh, several months ago. I counted one instance of a batter stepping out of the box. <laughs> okay, and yeah. now with some of these pitches, you can either meal between their pitches. They take so long. Well. 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, it's the game. Is, it's it's and the, these changes. Many of these changes were very subtle. They weren't really noticed at the time, and uh, the effects they were going to have, the overwhelming effect they were going to have in later years. Just um, you know, nobody nobody really imagined how much how different a game in 2000. 21 was going to look from a game from 1921. Well, it became more uh, visible. Yeah, became more visible in 2021 because of what happened in 2020. And they carried over the uh, extra innings, you know, minor on second base and extra innings. And they carried over the seven inning double headers. Yeah, and that's that's really unfortunate. Yeah, both of those are not going to be in effect the. In 2022, if the season starts on time, and so well, all, all, all this other stuff, you know, became more and more visible. Yeah, 148 batters struck out over 100 more, 100 more times last year. Uh, that's season. amazing. That's yeah. amazing. It really is. Yeah, you know, it's and uh, it's it's a shame, but you know. I know. I know the game is I, the game. The game still they're still getting people. Attendance, attendance is up in a lot of cities, and uh, we're we are in a minority. They, you know, I, they're definitely in a minority. Well, they don't market to us. You know. <laughs> no, they don't market it at all to uh, to the, uh, the fans who've really been with the game since they were kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in our age bracket, not no, no, no longer not. I don't know. And not too many of them are interested in the history because I think the average age in cyber is close to 60. Yeah, I know. I know. Mm-hmm. And in the 19th century committee, the average age is in Saber, the average age is probably closer to 70. And it's uh, it's crazy. But they really aren't, you know, the younger people, for the most part, really aren't interested in the history of the game. Uh, they're more interested in the stuff that's going on, and as you said, the analytics and you know these they all they all want to create a new stat. That that's the thing you want to do first, not write a biography of an un, unknown player and make him you know bring back a ghost from the past uh, and really add something to uh, the game's history and lexicon, but but rather create a new stat and give it you know whatever acronym they want to do and. Uh, that that to them is more important. Well, all these teams but anyway. Have, uh, it's, been, it's been great. It's been great doing this again with you, Al. And Ma- I know yeah, we're, we're approaching the zero hour, so uh, I, I just want to say once again, it's always a treat to work with you, and we, I really enjoyed today's discussion. The feeling is mutual. It always is. We'll do it again soon. Okay. Give my regards to Marilyn. I will. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.